Hey there, hi there, Geos. Um, coming to you from the Cheney residence. I'm keeping my voice low because uh, uh, the prince is soon to be asleep, so I don't want to talk too loudly. Um, but we need to finish with chapter three, uh, and so let's continue. Let's get after it, hopefully to get through uh, the rest of section two and maybe through most of section three today. Um, so uh, in regard to Russia's migration, um, what the Russian government was doing, um, we're talking 19, um, Stalin is in power, so the Stalinist era, uh, I know, my man Stalin, the 1930s, they're, they're forcing people to migrate into kind of the north centralist region, all right, that would be Siberia. What they're doing is um, they're, they're, there's a lot of possible work for iron and coal mines and, you know, uh, perhaps oil, oil drilling as well. And so they're encouraging these people to go because they'll say, you've got a good job, here you go. Um, you know, it's going to be a great, or we'll give you extra benefits, you know, longer vacation. Uh, but it ends up being, <clears throat> uh, ends up being a train wreck. People realize that, oh my gosh, Siberia stinks. All right, don't want to live there. It's, free, it's, it's freezing most of the year. Uh, it's just really inhospitable. So most of them end up migrating back. So Stalin's plan, bad for Mother Russia, no good. Um, this is just how, how large Russia is. It's the largest, largest country in terms of size in, in the whole world. Um, and you've got the central district, which would include Moscow. Then you have the northwest district, which would include St. Petersburg. Um, the Ural Mountains, that's that's um, a lot of oil um, can be found here. And then you just see the middle, all right? The, the nothing of Russia is Siberia. It, it does have the Trans-Siberian Railroad. But it's really, really desolate um, and cold throughout most of the year. Uh, this is just showing you migration in Russia today, more often than not. Um, places that are um, that are the purple um, or blue, that blue four or one, um, they they are the places that are seeing people going to it, and typically those places are going to be Moscow, and then over here St. Petersburg. Those are your two big cities. In, in Russia. Over here, you don't have a whole lot. See, net immigration in this region of, of Siberia and, um, you know, aging society here. You don't have a lot of people moving there. So Russia is um, really the only places that are seeing things happen, this uh, Western corridor. Russia, big. See, no one. No one in Siberia, but bears in hatred and cold. I mean, I like Russia. And it's just the projects they would do. This is this is this is building the Trans-Siberian Railway. All right, um, some seriously intense labor. All right. Now, leader of leader of Russia, who is it? It's Vladimir Putin. Guys, we could go on and on and on, and I might go back to this in class because I can make lots of Putin jokes. Um, entering intriguing guy, but you know, with, with with what's going on in our country, the whole election, 2016. Who knows? You know, you know who knows with Putin, but. He definitely is, you know, becoming kind of an authoritarian type of leader. So he's taken after, you know, Stalin and, and those before him in Russia. Motherland. Vladimir. Vladimir Putin. He, now he was KGB. All right, so don't mess with Putin. And then, yeah, we know what he does in his free time, his spare time. All right, man, who else does this? I mean, look at this guy. Look at this guy. I mean, no animal. All right, can contain the Putin. And then I'm sure this might give me, they might, they might, the Russian bots might be able to find me for, for posting this picture. Oh my gosh, be careful. Um, Canada, what do we see with Canada? We have funny Canada memes, but Canada, just like the United States population is moving from east to west. So your, your eastern places would have been big time Toronto or Montreal or Quebec City. And now we see people moving um, further and further to the west, wanting to go to Vancouver and Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, more and more and more. In Saskatchewan, there you go. That's one of the provinces people want to go to. Yeah, fun to say. All right, Canada memes. Let's go. Mm, true. Ah, yeah, there we go. I like the Canadians. I love them. And the number one import, uh, maple syrup. Did you know that that's actually their currency? They don't have real money. They just pay maple syrup. Did you know that? All right, maple syrup or maple leaves. That's all they do. They don't actually have money. Uh, they use it. Interesting country. And this is showing you again moving from population center, moving from this region, Toronto, Ottawa, the capital, and Quebec, moving more towards Edmonton, Winnipeg, and then you have uh, Vancouver over here, right on the border with the United States. <gasps> Blackmail. Um, China, where are they going? Guys, it's easy. It's easy. It's easy. 
Um, if anyone's moving, they're moving from the interior of China and they're moving to the east. They're either going to Beijing, uh, they're going to Shanghai, or they're coming here to Hong Kong. All right. I just heard today on NPR, October 23rd, 2018, that China just finished this incredible bridge um, that connects um, Hong Kong uh, to, gosh, I can't remember what the, where, where it connected, but it's like, it's 30 something miles long. It's incredible, this bridge that they built. I have to maybe look up some pictures and show you all in class, but it's apparently a feat of in architectural just in amazingness. Um, but people are going here because this is where the economic opportunity is in China. Now, question though, we know what about China? A lot of their people, if they're, you know, if they're trying to achieve a higher level uh, of status or, or do better for themselves in their lives, what are they doing? Are they staying in China? No, they're not. They're leaving. They're leaving and going elsewhere. So China's facing some serious brain drain. Now, this guy right here, he is the leader of communist China, and that would be Xi Jinping. All right, he is the leader. He just actually made himself basically leader for life in China. So he's like a Mao Zedong type of person. Here's a funny picture. He gets, oh man, you can't do this. You're in, in China, you're banned. Uh, all pictures of Winnie the Pooh are banned because someone, of course, on the internet sort of said that Xi Jinping kind of looks like Winnie the Pooh. And then it seemed with President Obama here. And so I'll let you be the judge, but you're not allowed to have pictures of Winnie the Pooh in China. Uh, Xi gets mad. Uh, you don't need to again write this stuff down. It's just quick. Uh, Brazil decided that they wanted to create a new capital. So what did they do? They called it Brasilia. So it's in the Amazon region right here. They wanted people to be, to kind of move from Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. They were becoming very populated. They wanted to move them to a more sparsely populated place of the country in the Amazon. And so they built a new capital, Brasilia in 1960. It saw some rapid population growth, but it really hasn't captured, hasn't really done that well besides that. Uh, your two places, if you're going anywhere in Brazil for economic opportunity, education, um, just in general, is Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. Now, Brazil has been on the cusp. They're one of those BRIC countries. And, you know, they hosted the World Cup 2014, and then they had the Rio Olympic Games 2016. So it's, it's you know, they're, they're, they're rising. Um, they've got some political issues going on right now. They're, they're in the grips of voting for a new president, so there's some corruption issues. But they're one of those BRIC countries on the verge. By 2050, I would assume they would be a, a, a stage four country. And there you can see the um, Statue of Christ, the Redeemer, overlooking Olympic Stadium in downtown Rio de Janeiro. Now uh, there's Brasilia. Cool. Where is it located? There it is in comparison to Rio de Janeiro. You see that. Look at the map. Okay. Um, for the United States, um, it, in the, as we got into the end of the, as we got into the Industrial Revolution uh, in Europe, 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you began to see a lot of people migrating to countries that were industrializing or the places that were soon to industrialize and the United States doesn't see our industrial revolution really until the 1880s, uh, 90s and 1900. And that's because of the civil war. Uh, you know, we're in the grips of that. But by the 1900, we see a lot of people beginning to move to the United States. And also, what do we see in places that have industrialized? We see a more urban population. So in 1800, USA, not industrialized, only 5% of our population lived in a quote unquote urban setting. 2015, that was all the way up to 81%. And what do we know about the world? The world overall, 7.6 billion of us. More of us, more than half, live in an urban setting versus a rural setting. And you're just Chinese babies. There you go. Pretty cool. <laughs> That's terrible. If you taught me to swim like that, man, I'd be, I'd, I'd be, I would be going nuts too. We will not do that with Martin. No, negative, negative. Um, Interregional migration for developed countries. Uh, the, the, the movement today is from cities to suburbs. Guys, you all know that. Why do you want to move, uh, if you're in a developed state, a stage four country, why do you want to move from the city to the suburbs? It's, you know, a better house perhaps, more or more space, privacy, perhaps better schools more often than not, safety, you know, you know, less crime. That's, that's the reason. And so typically that's what we're seeing. More people are going to go from an urban, urban setting to a more suburban. So you're not going to be living in downtown Cincinnati. You're going to be moving to Anderson Township. All right, good black man right there. That's a good picture. Nick Langan. counter -rubberization. Now, we are seeing some people go really, really kind of opposite. Instead of just, you know, going from urban to suburbs, they're going all the way. I mean, they're trying to go off the grid. So they're going to the boonies. And, you know, we're talking about complete, I don't want to say isolation, but you are 
you're really, you know, going a little bit, you know, to where you're, you're definitely going to be in a sparsely populated area. You might have to do, do, do with less of, of the typical goods and services that you would expect. Um, but you're okay with that because you're in a place that might look like this in Colorado or Idaho or Utah, Wyoming, in the United States, our big sky states, you know, lots of space, really tr green and fresh. And so you're okay to move away from the fast paced city uh, because this is the land that you might be looking at. I mean, look at that. That, that is just incredible, incredible. I mean, absolutely. I, I, I really, I do think Colorado would be, be a place, but I, I don't know why Pacific Northwest is kind of a place I want to go to, but this is pretty too. All right, water break. Pardon me, need a little sip. Sorry. Now look at the net migration that we're seeing, just where people are moving to, um, places that are seeing the p number of people coming in. Uh, your Western states, uh, Florida, now not surprising, you know, our border states are seeing more people come in. Uh, percentage of people moving in the United States in general. Look at this downward trend from 1990 and on. Now, a lot of that is we got into the, you know, the 2000, uh, 2010 teens is because of the housing crisis, the the, the um, housing bubble uh, when it bursts. That, that's going to, of course, force a lot of people or not let people uh, move because they're stuck or, you know, they just they've got to try to make ends meet or they can't. Um, now, the, these three definitions, very important. You're definitely going to see multiple choice questions about them on the test. Refugee, IDP, internally displaced person, and an asylum seeker. A refugee. Now, these would be our Syrian migrants. All right, the, you, you are leaving because of some type of like armed conflict or violence. And, and it's almost a 99.9%. .9 if you're a refugee, that's a forced migration. You are leaving because you're fearing life, limb, you know, the safety of you and your family. Um, in 2014 alone, we saw 19 million refugees in the world. Now, most of those were coming from Syria or Afghanistan. Um, and IDP, they're similar to a refugee, but they do not cross an international boundary. So if someone is moving from Syria, let's say they were living in Damascus, uh, which is the capital of Syria. Uh, let, let's go with Aleppo, Aleppo, which was incredibly bombed by the government. And let's say they move to uh, Damascus, the capital of Syria, um, but they move because of fear of their life in in Aleppo. That's um, that's going to be uh, that's going to make them an internally displaced person, asylum seeker. That's where you just you migrate somewhere, um, but you want to be seen as refugees. You, you, you it's your choice, but you do kind of feel if I stay where I am, I might be risking my life. Now I don't know if you're aware of that Saudi the Saudi Arabian journalist who. He, he now has been, uh, the Saudi government has admitted that he's dead, but all the things that are, you know, what happened to him, that, that it's kind of still up in the air and very murky. You know, he could have, if he felt threatened, you know, he could have tried to seek asylum somewhere and, and a government could be willing to take him in. Um, examples of asylum seekers, Edward Snowden, the guy you're looking right there. He was the NSA. He leaked that the U.S. government was basically tapping into our phones, going you know over and beyond what they they really should be doing to protect our country. And then this other guy, Julian Assange, he's the WikiLeaks guy. So he leaks. He and his I guess his group they leak government documents, and, and very often they are seen kind of as enemies because sometimes those are secrets and. Governments are, of course, afraid because it could jeopardize national security. They made a movie about um, Assange and it was played by Benedict Cumberbatch. And I, I don't, I think Snowden, they made a documentary about him. I'm not sure. He's still, Snowden's in Russia. He's still in Russia. Um, Assange is at the Ecuadorian embassy in Great Britain, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, that's just about, um, oh, in the United Nations, about how countries should react to refugees and how they should be more willing to take them in. So uh, read that at your own time, but the United Nations is more of an advocate for countries taking people in. Now, <coughs> excuse me, to obtain asylum in the United States, very long process. Um, and so it's not like you just show up at our door and we automatically let you in. Some countries it's easier, United States it's not. Um, all right, Trail of Tears, that's a terrible period in American history, right? Forced migration of Native Americans. This is a memorial in Nashville to the Trail of Tears. All right, people, it's a jazz type night. So 
I'll leave it for there. We'll pick up with um, the ending of, of Section 3 and finish Chapter 3 tomorrow, too. See ya.